Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Getty Center. That was a wonderful talk, Professor Hunt. I learned so much. <laughs> it's a tough act to follow. Um, in fact, the, the subject of the French Revolution is vast, and it's Christian doing chronology with its political, economic, social, and cultural consequences. How can one devote just a mere 40 minutes to the subject. The art of the pre-revolutionary and revolutionary periods is equally complex and so complex and multifaceted that I actually debated with myself which approach to take with you this morning. We could explore, for instance, enlightenment or republican ideas of the era as expressed in art, and I just pulled up one example. Um, painter's alley, and he, he's showing Cornelia here, the daughter of the Roman general Scipio. She's being visited by a, a friend, an acquaintance, who is showing off her box of jewelry. And she says, let's share, what jewels do you have? And Cornelia says, well, madam, these are my jewels, her sons, her children. So this is the Republican Enlightenment virtuous response in the face of ostentatious wealth. Or we could illustrate the narrative of historic events with works of art, and I, I think this needs no explanation. Or we could trace the development of an art collection formed within the period and thereby gain insights into the contemporary art market and the evolving aesthetic preferences of collectors. And this is a portrait of the Baron de Besneval in his, at home, excuse me, with his art collection. And these have been identified, the artists in the pictures. And he was commander of the Swiss Guards. When I say Swiss Guards, don't think Switzerland. Think the guards that protect the king. He was meant to be protecting the Bastille in Paris on that faithful day, July 14, 1789. And instead, he had retreated with the troops outside the city walls. And so the Bastille was stormed on his watch, so to speak. So if we wanted, we could follow the dispersal, dispersal of such a collection in order to observe the circulation of art during phases of transition and instability. And taking that path would lead us eventually to the formation of subsequent collections as displaced art found new homes in private and public venues. And depending upon which paths of succession we follow, we could ultimately find ourselves in a modern day art museum like the J. Paul Getty Museum here in Los Angeles. And I'm pleased to see that we're sharing the same portrait and I'll explain my reasons why for choosing this one a little later on. This chair is on view in the galleries. It's been um, reinterpreted just for today, uh, in, in time for today, but it's reinterpreted, display will continue. And I encourage you to look closely at this chair during the break. As many of you know, the collection of the J. Paul Getty Museum has more than a dozen decorative arts objects, formerly the property of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, as well as another dozen pieces that once belonged either to their forebears or to members of the royal family. And the reasons of why and the vicissitudes vicissitudes of how these pieces arrived here are due as much to the consequence of the revolution as to the acquisitive nature of later collectors who either prized the work of art's beauty or mythologized its royal provenance. And here is a portrayal of the queen in court dress and uh, a wall light that was from her private room at in the big palace at Versailles, which is now here at the Getty. 
Those of you who take a gallery tour this noon period will have the opportunity to study the works in person on display. And I encourage you to do this because looking closely at the design, materiality, and craftsmanship of these pieces delights the eye, really, it does, and trains the mind to recognize superlative quality. And as a curator of decorative arts, we, I propose that we take an object-based approach to this talk in order to deepen our understanding of some of the social, commercial, and aesthetic aspects about material culture on the eve of the revolution. And I brace yourself. I propose that we make a case study of four writing desks made in Paris during the second half of the 18th century. Now, I know you all think immediately writing desk when you hear the word French Revolution. <laughs> Doesn't everyone think that way? I realize the choice of such a workaday functional furniture type seems to be rather ancillary, even modest, when contrasted with the great events of the period and indeed the lives lost. But considering the fabrication and provenance of these four pieces reveals as much about their makers and their owners who, though coming from different spectrums of society, had to face the cataclysmic disruptions of the era, each in their own way. And this exercise that we'll take now has the dual benefit of introducing us to great objects and to historical figures. And we'll study the desks in chronological order according to the year of creation. Three of the desks belong to the Getty Museum. Those are the ones popped out with the yellow highlight. Two of which are on display in the South Pavilion galleries right now and two others are displayed at Versailles, including one of the Getty desks, the one in the bottom. So we'll begin with one desk, which is a very unusual double desk, made about 1750 by Bernard van Riesenberg II. Known by the initials of his stamp, and I hope you can see these initials, a B, V, R, B. So if I use the acronym BVRB, the initials BVRB, you'll know that I mean Bernard van Riesenberg, who was the son of an immigrant cabinet maker living in the neighborhood of the Faubourg Saint Antoine in the eastern end of Paris, not far from the fortress prison of the Bastille. That neighborhood was home to a community of cabinet makers, and the work of Bernard van Riesenberg was sold exclusively through dealers in luxury goods, and the dealers were known as Marchand Mercier. He himself did not have direct contact with clients, and his name, therefore, was not familiar to his customers and consequently, the name rarely appears in auction sale catalogs surviving from the period. But thanks to the presence of the stamp on his surviving pieces, we do know that his furniture reached the highest end of the market. To consumers of substantial wealth and status, such as the wife of Louis XV, the Queen Marie Leszczynska at Versailles, BVRB's furniture designs were very inventive and his use of materials were innovative. The desk of our focus is a unique, a, a neat, a unique piece. It's a double-sided drop leaf design and each long side opens to create a large writing surface and each interior has nine pigeonholes to store documents as well as a number of drawers. Two people could work in proximity, yet independently, at each side of this desk. Its ingenious form allowed users to quickly cover up any work in progress by simply closing up the hinged fronts. I would say that it would hide my mess. <laughs> and the contents of the desk could be further safeguarded by locks. In terms of materiality, the piece was extravagant, but sturdy and well-made. 
The carcass is of indigenous oak, which you can just see here at the back. And it is veneered with costly exotic woods imported from South America and the West Indies in the Caribbean. The ground wood is the reddish satine, this one, which in English translates to the word bloodwood. And it's from either Guiana or from the island then called San Domingue, which is now modern day Haiti. The inner fields of veneer, these, the lighter striated tulip wood from Brazil. And then these are end cut king wood, also from Brazil. Unfortunately, the wood veneer on the exterior of the desk has faded over time due to the exposure of ultraviolet rays of sunlight. And the wood veneer of the interior, however, which you see in the detail on the left, has been protected from light and retains its distinctive coloring. The gilt bronze mounds, and here you see just one, the little drawer pole, custom fit both the form of the desk and the pattern of the floral marquetry. And rather curiously, as you see on the right, the drawers are constructed of solid mahogany which was an exceptional and highly extravagant use of an exotic hardwood at the time. And I'll add parenthetically that it wasn't yet fashionable in France to use mahogany for the beauty of its grain. And we'll return to this matter later, but keep in mind that the transatlantic timber shipments to France were interconnected with a commodity, the commodity of sugar a plantation crop that depended upon slave labor. So, the Declaration of the Rights of Man in 1789, its reception in the French colonies, the 1791 slave uprisings in Saint-Domingue, and the abolition of slavery by the Revolutionary Convention government in 1794, all combined to change not just social and political life, but commerce, employment, and livelihoods as well. When the desk was purchased by the J. Paul Getty Museum in 1952 from a Scottish collection, it was rumored to have been associated with the French royal family. And supposedly the desk had been created for the twin daughters of Louis XV, the princesses Louise Elizabeth and Anne Henriette, born in 1727. At the time the desk was made, around 1750, the princesses would have been about 23 years old. But this was a story that was nothing more than myth, a mere romantic but impossible musing, because the elder twin, Louise Elizabeth, had already left France in 1739 to join her husband, the Spanish infant, Philippe of Spain, in their duchy of Parma in the Italian peninsula. Actually, the desk's 18th century provenance remained unknown until about the year 2000 when a description of the desk was finally recognized in an inventory of goods taken after the death of this woman. Allow me to present to you Anne Jarry, Madame d'Angers. She was the wife of a wealthy tax administrator, which in that time was called a fermier général literally translates as a tax farmer. And in the, de in the inventory, the desk was located in the couple's Paris residence, a townhouse they purchased in 1750 in the fashionable square then known as Louis Le Grand, today's Place Vendôme. And any of you who have gone to Paris and walked the Place Vendôme, you know it's home to Cartier and the, the most highest end of the boutique shops. The contents of their house and even the wood paneling of its interiors has, dis has been dispersed, but traces of its charming decoration can be seen by three rooms that have been reconfigured since then. I'm showing you two of them. The one on the left is Madame's boudoir, painted with charming little fables from De La Fontaine, and this is in the decorative arts museum in Paris, and one of 
two rooms from that Paris townhouse, another um, cabinet from the courtyard of the house, which is now installed in the recently reopened decorative arts galleries of the Louvre Museum. So returning to the inventory, the desk had the highest value, 1,600 livres, of all the pieces of furniture at that location. Its value was calculated, no doubt, based on its unique form, expensive materials, and exceptional craftsmanship. And it's supposed that Danger's two nephews, who were his junior, junior business partners, may have shared the desk when working with their uncle. And one of those nephews, the family heir, was later guillotined in 1794. Tax farmers were not popular. <laughs> 1794, the year of the Great Terror. As for the cabinet maker, Bernard van Riesenberg, he retired in 16, excuse me, 1764, selling the workshop and the contents to his son, Bernard III, who continued practicing his craft through the revolution until his own natural death in 1800. And in his later years, he lived through the trades evolution brought about when the National Assembly abolished the prevailing but medieval guild system in 1791. The next desk tells us a vastly different story. This is the famed mechanized roll top desk begun in 1760 for Louis XV by Jean-Francois Eubin, an immigrant craftsman who became cabinet maker to the king in 1754. And this position exempted him from guild jurisdiction and granted him a workshop in the royal arsenal in the eastern Paris, not far from the neighborhood of the Saint Antoine, where many cabinet makers lived and worked. Urban did not live to see the completion of the desk. He died in 1763 and it was finished by the workshop in 1769, which was then operated by Urban's erstwhile apprentice and successor, Jean-Henri Riesner, who had gained acceptance as a master of the Guild of Cabinet Makers in 1768. Requiring nine years to make, the desk was finally delivered at the exorbitant cost of 62,985 leaves. And I want to give you a comparison. An average cabinet maker's annual income was 400 to 750 leave. So that means that the cost of this desk was equivalent to about 100 years accumulated income of an average cabinet maker. Its cost was actually disputed by the crown, and Reasoner, the maker, had to itemize line by line each aspect of its fabrication in order to justify the total price. And this document is very informative. The desk was and remains a tour de force in terms of design, function, and appearance, as was only fitting for the royal commission, since the king was the supreme patron and protector of the arts in France. Destined for the king's inner cabinet at Versailles where the monarch worked in near privacy, the piece had ingenious protections to secure its contents. A single key for the master lock, which operated the rolling cylinder and locked the drawers. The desk also had separate access points, which you can't see too well in this slide, but I'll be able to show you in other slides these little drawers at the side were accessible to the servants so they could replenish the sand and ink and paper for writing. It had a hidden interior compartment and like the Danger desk from the previous decade, the king's desk was constructed of an indigenous oak frame which was veneered with beautifully grained imported woods, the same reddish satiné or bloodwood, purple heart, amaranth and Rosewood. The pictorial, market, or the pictorial marquetry on the surface rivaled the medium of painting for the illusionistic trophies that celebrated the monarch, the arts, poetry, music, science, trade, the navy, 
and the military. This is the back of the desk, and I'm showing you a blow up of the trophy of geography and cartography, which were critical studies in that era of globalization. Costly sculptural gilt bronze mounds complemented the iconography. So thus you see these cornucopia and, and low relief actually spill the fruits of the sea and the produce of the land as represented in two-dimensional marquetry. And then there were figural forms cast in the round, Apollo here, god of music and poetry, and Calliope, god, uh, excuse me, muse of epic poetry. Uh, she's seated on the other side of the desk, and both of them <clears throat> supported acanthus sleeves that became um, candelabra. And <clears throat> these mounts were cast, chased, and gilded by specialized metal workers who were responsible to Reasoner, who as a master craftsman signed and dated the desk on the back and the bottom right corner of the astronomy uh, trophy. And I, I apologize for this out of focus blow up, but it says Reasoner. J.H. for um, Jean-Henri and the date 1769. It's very unusual for a cabinet maker to inscribe, if you will, in wood his name. And here I present the, the cabinet maker himself. This too is unusual that a cabinet maker would have his portrait painted in such a fashion. Jean-Henri Reisner seated at one of his own writing desks. Originally, the monogram of the king would have appeared here between the twin cornucopia, but in an ironic twist of fate brought on by the fierce anti-feudal and anti-monarchical ferment of the revolution, Reisner was brought back and paid in 1794 to undo his earlier work. He replaced the royal motifs with the blue and white porcelain plaques and removed other offending royal attributes. Valued for its extraordinary merits, the desk was not sold by the bankrupt revolutionary government as was the case with so much of the furniture and precious contents of the nationalized palaces. The desk remained in the service of successive French governments rulers, officials, and administrators until 1957, when it was retired from active duty, so to say, and returned to Versailles to its original interior as a treasured art object. <clears throat> as for Reisner, his pre-revolutionary career flourished. In fact, it took off when he earned the prestigious appointment as cabinet maker to the king in 1774 and over the course of 11 years, from 74 to 85, Reisner delivered an unprecedented quantity of furniture to the royal households, totaling nearly a million leaves worth. Reisner was particularly favored by Queen Marie Antoinette, who appreciated the refined and elegant neoclassical style, the incredible naturalism of the pictorial marquetry, the jewel-like quality of the mounts, and the mechanical ingenuity of the workshop's practices, products rather. And many art lovers then and now consider this shimmering silver and mother of pearl roll top secretaire and sewing table that Reisner delivered for the Queen's boudoir at Fontainebleau to be the apogee of his career. And I, I want you to understand that when I say a piece made by Reisner, he did not make every single piece himself. He, he managed an enormous workshop, and he even subcontracted out with a network of specialized craftsmen. So when I say Reisner, think of him as an entrepreneur, cabinet maker, but also a manager. But not all of his deliveries to the crown were showy pieces. 
Many were relatively, and I say relatively, that's the key word, many were relatively simple and supremely functional, such as this flat top writing desk, sometimes called a table desk, ordered by Marie Antoinette late in 1776 for her husband's small private rooms on the top floor of the Petit Trianon. The oak carcass is veneered with the same two woods we've encountered before, the prized reddish satiné, bloodwood, and purple heart amaranth. And then for contrast, a plank of indigenous maple that was st stained bright green, but has since faded to this kind of drab olive green, was set on the drawer fronts to off, um, show off the gilt bronze freeze mounts. The underside of the desk still bears traces of the obliterated royal inventory number. I hope you can make it out, 2905, and the half of the brand mark of the garde mobe de la Reine, the, the furniture warehouse of the queen. Records surviving from the period tell us precisely when and where the desk was delivered. On August 6, 1777, to the drawing room of the king's private apartment on the attic floor of the Petit Trianon. And you may be interested to know that since 2001, the desk has provisionally returned to its original setting thanks to a long-term loan from the J. Paul Getty Museum. And here it is, back in that interior. The rooms of the suite, which still survive, were small, intimate, low-ceilinged, and cozy. In short, they were a far cry, literally and metaphorically, from the big formal rooms of the chateau at Versailles, a half hour's walk away. <clears throat> Sheltered from the public parade of the palace, the royal family could retreat here. And this is an one of the facades at the Petit Trianon, and that cabinet with the desk is this corner room here. Technically, Marie Antoinette enjoyed this pleasure house as her own domain, for Louis XVI had presented it to her in 1774. No one stayed without the queen's permission, and though the king visited, he never passed a night there out of respect for her right as the property's mistress. And it was here that the queen could relax from that formal court etiquette. And this portrait of her in that muslin dress that you saw twice now this morning, you imagine her in that dress in this venue. As we know from hindsight, the boon years for patron and supplier could not continue. In 1785, administrators from the royal households initiated economizing efforts and turned to more affordable craftsmen. Commissions to Reasoner dwindled and the workshop went into a dramatic decline. And the upheaval of the revolution brought on the ruin of the business and Reasoner was forced twice to sell the stock of his workshop in the mid 1790s. He took to buying back his own works when the royal collections were dispersed by revolutionary government at auctions advertised as, quote, sumptuous furnishings of France's last tyrants, end quote. Reasoner hoped to recover the true value of his pieces by reselling them when conditions were more favorable. But the scheme did not succeed and he died nearly destitute in 1806. And the desk from the king's apartment at the Petit Trianon, the one that we've been looking at, was purchased not by Reasoner, but by an unidentified agent named Dumont at the Versailles sales of the Petit Trianon in 1793. And to this day, its whereabouts during the 19th century uh, is, remains unknown. And I just want to show you this very rare surviving ephemeral poster advertising one of those sales of the contents of the Petit Trianon. And there is a note here in French at the bottom, alerting prospective buyers that 
the pieces purchased, the furniture could be exported from France tax-free. In other words, duty-free, duty-free shopping. <clears throat> and indeed, there were buyers from all over Europe and some even from the United States. We'll conclude with the fourth desk made in 1788 on the eve of the revolution. It's a roll top desk whose cylindrical front displays a single sheet of breathtakingly beautiful mahogany. Go to the galleries. It's just glorious. And the lower drawer fronts, these are veneered with ebony to set up a striking contrast. Overall, the colors and grain of the wood show off the exquisitely fine mounts, models such as these horn plain satyr boys, cast by the bronze workers Bellingham and Les Sieux, after designs by Gambier and Francois Raymond. And you have to indulge me, it's so unusual for us to know the names of these bronze casters, chasers, and gilders. Normally, these details remain unknown to us, the, the craftsmen anonymous. And this is a very old slide. It dates from the late 1950s or early 1960s, showing J. Paul Getty's original ranch house museum in Malibu. Uh, this desk was purchased by him in 1938, and it was displayed in his first uh, venue of the museum. The desk opens in a two-step process. First, one raises the cylinder by hand, grasping these two handles, and then pulls out, one pulls out the writing surface by grasping little handheld um, cutaways underneath this writing surface here. This action, pulling out this surface, brings forward a set of false drawer fronts. Do you see them back there, tucked away? They are actually attached to the back of the writing surface. So when fully extended, the false drawer fronts align with the functional drawers and the pigeonholes above. Designed to be highly serviceable, the desk features other utilitarian yet elegant details. Lateral pull-out shelves at each end extend the writing surfaces, possibly to accommodate one or even two secretaries. And each drawer is independently lockable. Each one has its own keyhole. All operated by the same uni single universal key, with the exception of one lock. The lock on the strong box built into the drawer frame, and that is a separate key. Thanks to the presence of multiple stamp marks, we know the cabinet maker, Bernard Molitor, B. Molitor. Another immigrant craftsman, Molitor achieved master status with the Paris Guild in 1787, only four short years before the aboli abolition of that ancient protectionist guild system. He started off his career well-placed, subleasing a workshop space from Reasoner at the Arsenal. And perhaps it was through that introduction of the elder master, Reasoner, that Molitor won the prestigious commission to lay a floor of ma mahogany parquetry in the boudoir of Marie Antoinette at the Chateau of Fontainebleau in 1787. So once again, we're looking at the very same images, but I ask you to look at the floor, which still survives. It's mahogany in a pattern of a radiating star. One can readily imagine the two craftsmen, Reasoner and Molitor, discussing the fabrication of this magical interior and its furnishings. And miraculously, the space can be seen today much as it appeared in 1787. But all of these pieces had left the chateau. In, in, the, in the mid 20th century, the, the beautiful mother of pearl furniture was in a, collect, a private collection in New York City. 
The timing of Molitor's career coincided with the growing French appreciation of, for mahogany as a timber and as a veneer wood. He was especially fortunate to work with the material before the French trade was disrupted and supplies became scarce. And you see the back of the desk here is entirely of mahogany, except for these uh, sections of ebony. After about 1791, mahogany had to be imported from London at much greater expense. And those of you uh, who know naval history will remember that um, there was an English blockade, prolonged blockade for years, um, more than 10 years, I think. So getting mahogany timber out of London was not only expensive, but a tricky business. The roll top desk matches a description of one inventoried in the second year of the Republican calendar, and that would be equivalent to 1793-94 when the late king's apartments at the former, in the late king's apartments at the former royal chateau of saint Cloud, In 1784, that chateau had been presented by Louis XVI to Queen Marie Antoinette as her private domain, and it became her preferred residence up through her last days of free movement, and she last stayed there with the royal family as late as November 1790. Louis XVI could not therefore have used the desk very much if it indeed was his. Eventually, it too was sold by the revolutionary government and by 1800, it had reached the London art market and it appeared twice at Christie's auction house in 1800 and 1801. And the Chateau of saint Cloud no longer stands having suffered fire and demolition in the late 19th century. So I'm showing you a, this painted bird's eye view of the chateau, which this view comes from the early 18th century. Unlike Reasoner, Molitor was able to navigate through the challenging vicissitudes of the Parisian furniture market during these troubled years by winning customers from among the most notable participants in current events. For example, the Marquis de Lafayette was one of his patrons, the same Lafayette who fought in both the American and French revolutions. Molitor's career, however, did have its own share of risks. A particularly dangerous point came when he had to appear before a convention tribunal that scrutinized his links to royal clients. He survived that ordeal thanks to the intercession of his cousin, Michel Molitor, who was known as one of the celebrators, celebrated stormers of the Bastille an action that was glorified by the appellation vanquishers of the Bastille, vanquilleurs de la Bastille. Jump-starting his affairs under the Directoire, year 3, 1795, Bernard Molitor's business picked up and his prosperity continued through the successive regimes from the consulate in Napoleonic Empire to the restoration of the Bourbon line in 1814-15. His last sale, in fact, was one of a, these, a pair of secretaires, this one being one of them. And a secretaire is a form of desk we haven't considered, but basically the drop front, front is hinged and just drops down. <clears throat> He delivered the pair of secretaires to the royal household of Louis XVIII, the restored Bourbon heir and king, to the Chateau of saint Cloud. And here you see an 18, excuse me, a mid 19th century interior of one of the rooms at the chateau with the Empress in the Empress Eugenie's apartments, with that famous bureau de roi the one Reasoner made and delivered in 1769. Here it is serving the Empress Eugenie. Anyway, with Molitor's 1820 delivery of secretaries to saint Cloud, his career had come full circle. He died in 1833, having, leaving a considerable fortune 
which was no small feat for a cabinet maker who lived through decades of political, economic, social, cultural, and stylistic change. In in conclusion, I hope this little survey inspires you to go out to the galleries at lunch time to look at these objects. And when you look at them, to consider the eventful histories of the objects themselves, their owners, and their makers. Thank you. <laughs>